Good morning, Abundant Life. It is. Okay, and the, the second time, you're a friend, but third time, you're family. This is my third time here, so whether you like it or not, I'm just saying I'm family. Thank you. You are so kind, and I do love coming here. You are just a sweet, loving, welcoming family of God, and I praise God for you. And, and uh, would you please join me as we pray and ask God to bless this time. Precious Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for this day that you've given us, Lord. Whether it's raining outside or whatever it's doing, Lord, we know that your sun is shining in this place right now, and we praise you for that. I ask that you would open our hearts. May uh, we receive what you have for us today, Lord, and I pray that you would take my words and shave away my thoughts, my opinions, and just let your truth be spoken. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Now, I do, in all sincerity, I do want to start with an apology. Uh, if you remember the first time I was here, I said, if you have any problems or concerns. Remember, it was Steve Longstreth that reached out to me. Um, and then just a couple days ago, I uh, jumped on your website. I wanted to see if there was anything new, updates with, with, your, with your pastor search, and I noticed something that I didn't notice before. Your service is from 1030 to 1130. I was preaching way past 11.30, and I am so sorry. I, th I was thinking 12 o'clock, and I'm like, man, we're, I, I'm preaching, and we're getting out early. But I didn't realize I was holding you late, and I do apologize for that. But, but today, I promise, before the Steeler game starts, I will be done. <laughs> Many of you, you will remember uh, in, in history, many of you have learned this in one way or another, there was something called the Great Awakening many years ago in our country and in other parts of the world. And a major player in this Great Awakening, this revival, was a gentleman named George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield preached for 34 years during the Great Awakening, 34 years, averaging three sermons a day for 34 years. Three sermons a day, averaging three sermons a day. And in that time, approximately 80% of all Americans heard him preach. Now, when they heard him preach, they heard him obviously live. They were not able to flip on the local television station and watch him. They were not able to do the live stream in the 1700s. They still only had dial-up at that time. They weren't able to do the live stream. So if they wanted to hear this pastor, this man of God, preach, they had to go to hear him preach. Now, you didn't travel long distances um, typically at that time, especially if you were with your, your, your family and you're trying to, to gather a group to go, which meant that George Whitfield would ride from place to place sharing God's Word, again, averaging about three times a day for 34 years and reaching 80% of all of America during that time. That is amazing. And what I want to do today is, God willing, I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you. As Abundant Life Church, I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to continue on the calling that God has 
for your life. And not just for you as an individual, but for you as a church family. Now, we tend in our lives, we tend to look at uh, the world in a national perspective. Okay? We tend to look at a national perspective. And uh, it, to show you what I mean, if I were to ask you if you could tell us who our current president is, pretty much everyone in here would raise their hand and say, yes, I know who our current president is. But if I were to ask you who is your local school board president, not so many hands would go up. There may be a couple here or there, but for the most part, you, you, you wouldn't know your local president or your local school board president, excuse me, or, or local representatives or, or, or whatever. And that's, that's common, okay? That's common because we live in a world where we have a national perspective or even an international perspective. Our, our news isn't so much just, you know, what the, what the high school team do uh, last night and uh, what's the weather supposed to be tomorrow and, and uh, this is what's going on at the fairgrounds or uh, whatever the case may be, that we get the world's news if we were to turn on even our local news. We hear what's going on in other states, across our country, and even around the world. It's very hard for us to keep just a, a local perspective in the world we live in. Now, here's what Scripture uh, says that sh- and uh, that I want to share with you. If you have your Bibles, if you could please turn with me. It's the verses that the gentleman read earlier. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23, 24, and 25. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through these, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to hit a couple highlights here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, reading from the Christian Standard uh, Bible. It says, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now here's what I want to share with you this morning. You are in a situation that unfortunately is not that uncommon in churches in our country today, in our state, and even in our county. You are in search for a pastor. You are in search for a pastor, and I, I want you to know truly that uh, I, I have uh, been praying for you. Um, my, my church, we, we, we pray for you. My family, we pray for you. And uh, not just for you to find the right man of God for your congregation, but for you as individuals. And it tells us in verse 23, let us hold on to the confession of our hope. Or some translations say hold fast. Hold fast. And that's where I got the the title for my message today. It's hold tight. I want you to hold tight in your confession, in what you believe, in what you stand for. Okay, hold fast or hold on or hold tight to the confession of our hope without wavering. Since he who promised is faithful, the he who promised, of course, is our Lord. He's made a promise to you. And are you standing on those promises that we just sang? Are you standing on them? Do you believe in them? Are you standing on those promises? The one coming from the rock, our Lord Jesus Christ, a foundation that cannot be shaken. Are you standing on those promises? Believing that what God has begun in your life, 
He will see it through until it is complete. That verse says to hold on or hold fast without wavering. Without wavering. Now, the Greek word here for without wavering is elklanes. Excuse me. Elklanes. And that means immovable. Immovable. Without wavering, immovable. So let's read that with, with including that English translation of the Greek word there. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope being immovable since he who promised is faithful. Holding fast to the confession means maintaining a consistent confidence in the salvation Jesus brings through his faithful life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus brings through his faithful life, his death, and his resurrection. Can you, we are, we are in late January. January is almost over. And, and, then, and then we're going to uh, celebrate this day called Valentine's Day, where on February 13th, you can buy roses for like $20. And then February 14th, they're like $85. Okay, but we're, and we're going to celebrate this day. And we're going we're gonna, to, uh, you know, maybe give some candy or, or a flower to our sweetheart or maybe go out to eat, maybe stay in and just enjoy time together, you know, whatever. That's, it's all wonderful. But right after that, we're going to start getting ready for what we know is Easter. And that is part of the rock of our faith, is the life of Jesus Christ walking this earth, fully man, fully God. Him giving his life up, being crucified, his death, and his resurrection three days later. His resurrection three days later. Now, if you have a story that can beat that, please share it with me. But I haven't found one that can beat that yet. And that's where I want to put my faith. That's where I want to hold tight. Is to Jesus who left heaven to come to this earth to live and not live in the lap of luxury, not be a spoiled king, not be someone who summons every little whim that he feels that he wants, but he came in the most humble way that I could imagine, lived a life where it, it was, again, so humble that when people would say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. He would say, that's great, but you got to count the cost first because I don't have a bed to rest my head in. I don't have a home that I go to at night that I call my own. If you want to follow me, you got to count that cost. And while he was here on this earth, he allowed himself, allowed himself, that's what Scripture tells us, he allowed himself to be crucified on that cross. And in doing so, paying my debt, paying the price for my sins, that if I had a million lives, I couldn't pay off. But Jesus Christ paid that debt for me. We continue, verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. Let us consider one another 
in order to provoke love and good works. Now, I've got to be honest with you. When I use or hear the word provoke, it's typically not in a positive way. When I was growing up, I would provoke my sister. It wasn't, it wasn't to do what the Scripture says, to provoke her in love and good works. And truth be known, she was usually the provoker. I'm just, you know, trying to be polite here. But, but, but truthfully, I, I, typically I do not think of that word in a, in, a, in a positive way. But Scripture is telling us here that we're to provoke love and good works. And when you provoke, you push somebody a little bit. Okay? You, 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 you push them a little bit. But what are we pushing them to? What are we, as abundant life, what are we pushing each other to? Are we pushing each other to love and good works? Or are we doing the provoking like a brother and sister would do? Are we pushing each other to to share the love of Jesus Christ, to serve each other, to love each other, to help each other meet the needs that are represented in this congregation this morning? Are we being the church that we are called to be. Well, Pastor Dave, we don't, we don't, have, we don't have a pastor right now. We're just, we're just trying to, to stay alive. We're just trying to keep things going. I understand that. I, 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 get, I get that. And there's some truth behind that. But I pray for you. I provoke you to regardless of who is, is the shepherd of your congregation, the under-shepherd, really, we should say. Our, our, our shepherd is Jesus, of course. But the under-shepherd, regardless of who that under-shepherd is, that you are still provoking one another to love and to good works. You're still encouraging one another. You're still helping one another. Now, let's say, I don't know what your, what your beautiful sanctuary could hold. I don't know, a few hundred, uh, I'm not sure. But let's say for a moment it was absolutely filled. That each seat was just filled. I mean, there was, there were, there was standing room only. That would be good, right? We would, we would go home that day saying, that, that's a win. That was a good day. Would the pastor speak? I don't know, but there were so many people there. What were the announcements? I don't know, but there were so many people there. We would say, that's a good thing. And that's not bad. Now, now let's say, let's say your, your church continues to grow. So now you're not only just packing out your sanctuary, but you've got to go to multiple services. Okay, you gotta have you gotta have an earlier service and a later service and 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 not invite Pastor Dave Decker to speak at the early service or the the second service is gonna start late, you know, if we have him speak at the first one. So you gotta strategically work it out here. And then all of a sudden that but that second service now is packed. And that's beautiful. But do you know if you did that week after week after week after week, you would still only be ministering to a fraction of the lost in this area, in the city of Washington, in the county of Washington. You would still only be ministering to a fraction of the lost in this area. And we're going to come back to that, but let's move on to our, our, our next verse here, verse 25. Not neglecting to gather together. It's great, truly, to know for that phrase right there, I'm preaching to the choir. 
I'm literally preaching to the choir, and that's beautiful. Not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, when you put those three verses together, I pray that you are encouraged and you are challenged. That you are encouraged and that you are challenged. And that you, you start doing some, some provoking in a good way now. I don't need any brothers going home and provoking anybody and saying, Pastor told me to do it. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about we're, we're provoking to love. We're provoking to good works. We're provoking each other to do what the Lord has called us to do. And in verse 25, it says encouraging each other. And encouraging each other more and more and more as the day approaches. More and more and more as the day approaches. It does not say in these verses that, that we should be doing this if we have a senior pastor. We should be doing this if we have a, a large youth ministry. We should be doing this if we have this ministry or this ministry. We should be doing this if our congregation is full, if the sanctuary is full. We should be doing this if everything's going perfect. It doesn't say that. It just flat out says that this is what we are called to do. Period. Okay. Now, if if let's go back to these this sanctuary being filled, and we're at multiple services here. Okay, and and uh, I don't. I, I maybe maybe God really just just starts pouring out the blessing of abundant life, and this would be wonderful. Okay, so you grow and you build and you everything's just just God is just blessing. Now all of a sudden you're a mega church. Now I, I'm not I'm not knocking on mega churches. Okay, uh, I I I uh, I'm not knocking on mega churches. But let's say all of a sudden you become a mega church. And you would, you would sit in, in these seats, in the, in the, again, in this congregation, in this sanctuary, or, or if you were to build, you, you know, a, a different sanctuary. But you're sitting there, and, and you look around, and wow, we are, we are filled up. We are, look at this, look at this. Again, we don't know what anyone's preaching about. We just know there's a lot of people here. And that's good. That's really, really good. But then we start to say, you know what? There needs to be this ministry. But they got the staff for that. It's a large church. They have, the staff is covered. They, they got someone to do that. And, and this needs to be done. But they have someone to do that. They got the large staff. And all of a sudden, we're sitting there thinking everything that God wants to do is taken care of because it's a big church, has a big staff. And we just sit there and say, yep, there's a lot of people here. Instead of saying, what am I called to do? Why am I part of this body? Why am I part of this family? Why has the Lord put me here in this congregation at this time? And I ask you, why? Why he, has he done that? If this church were filled right now, we would look at that as a victory, as a good thing, and I believe we should. With all my heart, I believe we should. And if we reached, if this, if this church, Abundant Life, reached 100,000 souls this year, 
that would be absolutely beautiful. I mean, please call me up, let me know, and let me celebrate with you beautiful. That would be amazing. We would look and say, that's a win. That's a good thing. But when our world, which I believe, I didn't check the, uh, the exact latest numbers, and I should have, I apologize. But I, I, I believe we're, we're approaching eight, 8 billion, just under 8 billion people in this world. And abundant life reached 100,000 in the year 2023. As beautiful as that is, we take our international perspective and say, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. In that almost 8 billion, 7.5 7.5 to 8 billion, somewhere in there. 32% of the world claims to be Christian. 32%. And it's actually the largest number, the largest faith, largest religion, if you will. Of course, Christianity is not a religion. But if you allow me to use that word, it's the largest religion in the world percentage-wise. Now, if 32% of the world was Christian and abundant life, and I'm, I'm, I'm jealous, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. It's, so I want to put my church in there too. Abundant life reached 100,000 souls in the year 2023. And I want to say Lighthouse has reached 100,000 souls in 2023. Because I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. I want to be in there with you, okay? So, so your ch- church has reached 100,000. Our church has reached 100,000. It would still be about 32% of the world would be Christian. But now, that's the international or even the national perspective that we're so used to. Let's break that down now. Let's go local. Let's go to this area that abundant life is a light in. is a loving community. And I don't say that lightly. I feel so welcomed here, and I I love you, and I appreciate that. I praise God for that. But you are the loving, light-shining, God's Word-preaching church that you're called to be. And if each one of you We're thinking small here, okay? We're thinking small. But if each one of you focused on one lost soul this year, just one, you just, you just, you just, I don't know, did what Scripture tells us to do, and you discipled that one lost soul, You discipled that one. And this year, that one soul, each one of you, that led that one soul to Jesus. And then next year, now that you are doubled, each of you again reaches that one soul. All of a sudden, you're being the church. You're changing lives. If you reach 100,000 in one service, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. 
But if we take those, to us, to me at least, those big numbers, and we just focus on that one soul, and we take the, the 32% of the Christians in the world. And that 32% focused on one for one year. And then, after one year, that 32% turned into 64%. We're off to the races, aren't we? We're not at 32% anymore like we were when we reached a couple hundred thousand. We're at 64%. And if each one of those in that 64% reached one, I don't teach math, but that's more than 100%. All of a sudden, the world has been reached. How beautiful is that? And here's where I'm going with this. I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to intimidate you. Not that I, I'm really an intimidating guy, and I, I, I don't want to come across that way. But I don't want to say, "Oh my goodness, you, you got to be reaching and, and 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 teaching," which you do. You absolutely do. We all must do that. But if we just did what we were called to do, and even if it was just focusing on that one, and every Christian focused on that one, Jesus, Jesus, how many times did he focus on that one? How many times did he have crowds surrounding him? And it was just that one he was speaking to. He has, I don't know how many, surrounding him and a lady caught in adultery. And they're all holding their rocks. And Jesus has a captive audience. They're going to listen to what he's saying because they came to him. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to bait him. They're trying to cause trouble for him. And they all have their rocks ready to throw at that woman. And Jesus didn't focus on the whole crowd. Or from a different perspective, he did focus on that whole crowd. But he did it by sharing the truth with that one. And he told the crowd, hey, if, you, if you're the one without sin here, go ahead, throw the first rock. Throw the first stone. And one by one, that crowd dispersed. And all of a sudden, there was one left, and it was that woman. And Jesus ministered to that one. Or what about the woman at the well? That one woman at the well. Read that story. Because Jesus and that one woman had a little conversation, and before that story's over, that woman's running all around town saying, come on, you got to hear what this guy is saying. You got to hear. He knew my past, and he still loves me. He knew my present, and he still loves me. You have to come and hear, because Jesus loved that one. All of a sudden, that one is running all around the, the, the city saying, come on, you got to hear this. Come on, come on, come on. Because of that one. And Jesus, again, he only had 12 disciples. And in those disciples, he broke that group down 
to a little bit more intimate group with James, John, and Peter. And there were times where he even broke that down and he was just one-on-one. And to this day, Jesus changed the world and is changing the world and is saving souls and saving lives for all eternity. And he did what he did for abundant life. And I don't know your exact situation. And I I, I don't know. I do, to the best of my ability, understand it can't be easy. As a church, it's, it's not easy to go a long period without a pastor. It wears you down. It hurts. It causes friction. But in that situation, we got to look at these verses and we got to hold tight, hold on, hold fast to our confession of our hope without wavering being immovable since he who promised Jesus is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. Not neglecting to gather together which obviously you have not. Praise God. You're, you're not sitting on the outside saying, well, I'll come when there's a pastor. Well, I'll come when this, when out. No, you here in this sanctuary are saying, we are the church. We are the church. And we're going to continue to minister as long as God allows. We're going to continue to encourage each other, love each other, Push each other to good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Abundant life, don't you ever neglect giving up. Don't you ever forgive me. Don't you ever neglect gathering together. Don't you ever give up. I know it's hard. I know there's probably, I, 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 I truly, I do not know the ins and outs at, at, at all, but I know there's probably just a handful of people running in a hundred different directions to keep everything going in this church. But what would happen if every single one of you stood up and said, now nah, I'm part of the church. It's time to get my hands dirty. Someone stood up here and and said there is a ministry, a mission, and they're asking for our help. And there was 32 or 35 boxes, whatever it was. Again, I'm no mathematician, but there's more than 30-some people in here. And if only half of you rolled up your sleeves and said, all right, I'm signing up. How can I help? What can I get? You're going to have what you need to minister to somebody in a whole other state that through food, there's going to be an opportunity for them to hear the gospel because you bought a bowl of Cheerios for somebody. I I don't know what the food is, but seriously. Abundant life. God bless you. And may you take these verses, God's very word, and allow it to continue to encourage you day in and day out to stand fast, hold fast, and be the church that you are called to be. Would you please stand with me? And we're going to close in prayer.
precious Heavenly Father, how I thank you for this loving family. That a couple times, a few times now has welcomed me into their, into their church family and allowed me to share your precious and perfect word with them. And I ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, and they would be the church you have called them to be. And I pray, Lord, I do believe the right man, the pastor for this congregation is out there. I do believe that. I know that according to your word. And I just pray that at the right time, that connection would be made. Maybe it's already been made and they're just, uh, they're just taking the steps there. Maybe that it's around the corner. I don't know, Lord, but I know the one who does know and has it completely in control. I pray that your blessing would fall upon abundant life, your love would fall upon abundant life, your encouragement, your truth would fall upon abundant life. And through the amazing people in this sanctuary, they would be the church that you have called them to be. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. God bless you.